might even hear the same word. And so far, I haven't heard it. So, um, so I'm sure uh, Jeff's referring to CARP and where we're at with CARP. And it's a really interesting thing with CARP. I joined Fisheries in 2007. And in the first couple of months I was in Fisheries, I met with the CSIRO and they said, we've got this thing called a CARP herpes virus. We've done all of the testing, it's ready to be released. And that was 2007. Jump forward a few years to Barnaby Joyce getting up in Parliament and saying, we're going to release this car for us, we're going to get rid of car. And it had a lot of momentum. Barnaby fell off the wayside. And, you know, and, then it, and the, the most disappointing thing from my perspective is everyone seemed to turn against the car for us. And within this room, I'm sure it'll still be controversial. But, but, um, we had environmental agencies saying, look, we're worried about it. We had farming groups saying, we think there's going to be black water events. And then we had fishers going, well, maybe carp aren't so bad, you know, with carp in the water, we've, you know, they've adapted now, they're not as bad as they used to be, um, cod eat them and trout eat them. If you fish the upper Goulburn and you look at what's going on with carp going the upper Goulburn, the Halper and others, it breaks my heart. And if you look at DART now, what's going on with carp, what will happen if the carp virus is released is there will be less carp, all right? There will be less carp. The carp virus is through Asia and it's through Europe, all right? And there are great trout populations and there are great um, fish populations in those places. And there is no evidence of the carp virus getting into those other populations. No evidence at all. No one can actually say, here we have trout dying because of the carp virus. But somehow this has been allowed to get out there. And what's happened now is the Commonwealth are moving away from it. Every meeting that we have with them that, oh, look, it might be another five years, it might be another 10 years, we're gonna do further testing. If that virus is released at some point, we will have less carp. And in the space where those carp were, we will hopefully have a reabundance of glaxids, of smelt, of gudgeon. So it won't be that the fish populations we've got now will all uh, go hungry. We will see the recovery of a lot of small body natives in waters where they used to be before carp were in there. So I would implore each of you as advocates of fishing, not just in Victoria, in Australia, to continue to push um, on the virus because it will be a good thing, uh, hopefully if it's released at some point. Anyway, that's, that's the, our position. Is that right? So did you hear that? So um, thanks, that's three months. Uh, we, we all have an announcement. So, so that does scare me because the, the, the language used to always be it was going to be released. It was just the timing of when. And now it seems the conversation has turned to will they or won't they ever release it? So anyway, I hope that answers your question, Jeff. There's a lot of hands going up over here, Tilly. I think I've started something. Yeah, that's all right. Um, Karen here from the Recreational Women and Recreational Fishing Network. Hillary, question for you. Um, so at the moment we're having a big push to get more females into fishing. And we're just wondering, we've heard you've had a lot to do with getting more women into fishing over in America. So we're wondering what tips you'd have for everyone in the room and all the organisations here that could help increase the number of women in fishing in Australia. Well, uh, for starters, thank you for the question. And uh, several years ago, I was at a conservation um, retreat with a lot of CEOs of manufacturing companies, Sage and Patagonia, and um, you know Orvis, and all these um, groups of mostly men, all men, in fact. And uh, I got invited at the last second because they looked around and said, "Well, gosh, this is all men who are here at this at this conference." And um, after the conference ended, we all got to go fishing together, and at that point, um, the vice president of Orvis got paired up with me to fish, and I look over, and he's nearly in tears, and I said, what, what's going on with you? My God, you're a mess. And he says, I just realized that this is the first time I've fished with a woman as a peer, and here he is, the vice president of Orvis. And he was so upset by that, um, that he made it a personal mission to create these labs and so at the Oris Guide Rendezvous and um, throughout our IFTD and AFTA, those are our organizations for fly fishing in the US conferences, um, there were these women labs and men were invited to, and what these labs were, were these concentrated networking um, operations of finding out what are the barriers to entry for women, um, why don't we have more women involved, how can we retain them, and um, what we found was we actually were doing better than we thought, it's just that Women, for one, weren't doing a great job of reporting all the fishing they were doing. They maybe weren't posting them on Instagram as much as the men, or they weren't um, talking about all their fishing adventures as much. But we uh, realized that we had 30% women in fly fishing specifically um, within the industry, 
And so at that point, the industry as a whole, and this is within our association, the leaders of all of the industry, said, well, we can get to 50-50. And, um, and it wasn't meant to be a literal number, 50-50 being as many women as men in the industry. It was meant to go, why the heck wouldn't we? We think the beetles are popular and puppies are cute. We should have women in fly fishing. There can and should be as, women, as many women as men in this organization um, you know, that we love at, 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 uh, at the top level. And that was our association saying that. So they wanted to pass that down through manufacturing, through clubs and organizations, through guiding and outfitting, and um, it caught on industry-wide. So now you hear 50-50 on the water is an industry-wide, not necessarily campaign, but pledge like a fist of solidarity saying, we all believe that there can and should be as many women as men within the industry, not just at a participatory level, but also at every stage. So as leaders in manufacturing, in creative work, um, in guiding and outfitting, in fisheries management, um, in all of these different roles, uh, there can and should be as many women as men. So it took an industry-wide push um, and constant participation uh, and, and, and also constantly looking at uh, where we are, benchmarking along the way. So now the industry has released numbers that we are now at 35%. Literally, we have some pushback saying, well, we'll never get to 50. But that's like saying, oh, well, we'll never have nobody smoking or bullying people or, you know, all of these things that you'd like to fix. Um, as long as you're aware of it and there's constant um, consciousness, we have found an improvement in, in retention. Uh, and keep, and it, Kind of started with to answer your question um, inviting women into things like this consciously bringing them into to speak and to learn and participate um, making you know everybody feel welcome not just women but understand we are all in this together and then also sticking with it constantly so it wasn't just like a ladies wine night at the fly shop there's zero retention in that they'll come and drink all your wine and what you want is for them to come and fish together as peers, as friends. And so since I've been here in Victoria, I've um, put the men I've been fishing with on the spot and say, well, why the hell do you want women to fish with you anyway? And, it, and they would say, well, we like women in all areas of our life. We like to live with them and work with them and play with them. Why wouldn't our favorite pastime be something we would want to spend time with them doing? And I think that that is the most honest and genuine and, and perfect answer that women and men are together in our lives all the time in this world, why wouldn't your favorite thing be something that you would want to do together? This is a question for Hillary. She stole my thunder, I was going to ask the same thing. <laughs> Um, it's okay, I was going to pump women in fly fishing. No. Um, my question, Hillary, is one of the challenges we have, um, as, um, as you're hearing today, uh, we've got a lot of momentum partnerships growing, uh, is the volunteerism. Uh, the numbers are terrific in the context of where they were three to five years ago, but uh, that really is our challenge going forward, is to mobilise the great army of fishers out there. And um, in my opinion, I think, um, as we've seen today, family, children, which women are very much a part of, will, will be part of this momentum that will occur in the future. But my question to you is specifically, how is the volunteers mobilised in your neck of the woods, your country, as you've observed participation in what's largely conservation land, river health, and so on? Thank you for the question. So the first thing that we notice in a big push to get more people on the river is that you can potentially be doing the loving your river to death kind of a thing where then suddenly you have all this pressure. We're trying to keep pressure off fish and we're trying not to have so much impact on our riparian zones. So from the very beginning, when we try to get more people involved in fishing, we're from the very first step introducing some of these risks to the environment, saying if you don't understand these things first, you don't pass go, you don't get to fish. This is your contribution to this fun thing is understanding your impact. And so what we've done with that is, and by we, I mean, again, collectively in the industry, we have some great associations that are able to work with people at all levels of fishing. And what we found is that when we're pushing people to get involved, we're also showing them the different zones where they can fish, what some of the risks and rewards are in those zones, including native fish, wild fish, 
um, and places where you can learn and grow in your fly fishing. And maybe that might be um, ponds and local um, municipalities and things like that before you kind of learn how to get back into the back country where it's a little bit more delicate. And so volunteers are doing that. So at local clubs and organizations, the volunteers are teaching new anglers that they're trying to get in, the conservation is the first thing, and that this is their contribution to keeping our fisheries healthy before they teach casting. And I'm not kidding, we I have um, fishing classes and casting clinics at my fly shop every single week, and they're accustomed to having 20 minutes to half an hour of classroom time in my fly shop before they even touch a rod. Um, casting for recovery, uh, for example, is, is having a thousand women a year learning how to fly fish. It's the number one organization for getting more people into, into fly fishing right now, and they're teaching conservation is the number one thing. And so the volunteers are really heavy into that because you know that this is your stead. This is how you're able to give back. Um, so I would say because um, we are aware of this pressure issue and there's just so many people on the planet, we want them to fish, then it's our responsibility before we teach them how to tie on their gear, um, they've got to learn how to take care of the resource. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Hillary, for coming. I just thought, has America got any success with invasive species? I understand you have tilapia over there, we do in the north. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing where you... Oh yeah, yeah, gotcha, <laughs> thank you. Has there any been any success with invasive fish like tilapia or... I hear you even have boa constrictors in the Everglades or something. Have you had any good news stories from invasive species in America, please? You mean in terms of taking care of them, like uh, getting rid of them? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, y yes and no. Um, because in the U.S. there are already some uh, protective measures in place for the fish that are endangered, um, a lot of those things were in place before there was kind of this invasive issue. So it wasn't like um, we had all these fish and everything was doing fine and then there was an invasive that was put in and then it all went to hell. Um, a lot of these fish in those areas, like the Everglades, were already under a lot of duress, like the lake issue you have, you know, with, with the stream going the wrong way into the bay. And um, so we already have these captains for clean water organizations that are already taking care of this. So when an invasive um, comes into play, like tilapia, it's already undergone. So you already have a culture of understanding that that fish um, poses a potential threat, and the science is already showing what level of a threat it is. So um, you don't have kind of people saying, oh, I wish that fish would stay, or I wish that fish was there. For example, in um, where I live, it's an intact ecosystem, meaning we have no invasives, all of our native species are intact, we haven't introduced or lost any, which is remarkable for the entire world. Um, a, for a little bit farther away from me, somebody decided to come in and do some bucket biology and bring in some um, walleye, which uh, you know, is delicious, but if I want walleye, I'll go to Wisconsin or Minnesota. And um, the locals, instead of saying, oh, walleye are awesome and we would love to fish for them, went, yeah, that's not okay, opened up a fishing derby for two years and they're gone. So um, the fishing derbies actually um, where we are are pretty um, prolific and we have map days for lake trout in our big flathead lake that take out 3,000 Mackinac um, and at the same time that's happening, the tribes on the other side of the lake are gill netting and um, rope known and, all, and taking care of lake trout there without opposition. So um, we've got people working together on their strategies um, with very little pushback from folks who maybe um, would like some of those um, non-natives or invasives. Um, they, I think that the folks who would speak up to want some of the invasives are also very undergone um, because the other fish have been um, pedestal for so long. Um, first of all, I'm John from Morning to Think for Fly Fishes. I'd like to say thank you to the fishers at the moment for what you guys are doing and abolishing boat ramp fees and open up new waterways for the urban anglers like Ferntree Gully and Frenchton Reservoir. Um, with the stocking of Goldburn at open season, we put so many tons of large trout in the water and the social media presence and the information that comes from that is great that you see a lot of kids and people catching big fish in that area. 
can we siphon some of those big fish off for the urban family fishing lakes? Because you do stock it a lot, but they're all the small 300 grammers and you don't really see that social media presence anymore of people going out to um, all the small reservoirs and stuff. But there are fish there and there's big fish there that all the little kids can just ride their bike down and have a fish for. That's a really good question. I'm going to say about this. Hard potato, hard potato. Yeah, really good question. The answer is we will, and we are. Um, they are expensive to grow, but we're building a capacity at Snobs Creek. We've just leased another farm across the road. Uh, we're looking at putting out one and a half million trout this coming year, and we're going to quarantine a significant number of bigger fish exactly for that purpose. The other thing we're doing is trout are great for family friendly waters uh, through the winter and through the spring, but often they don't perform well in summer. So we're going to augment those family friendly waters with native fish as well over summer. The kids can come down, ride their bikes on a hot summer's afternoon, catch a silver perch. So we're very much into that space. Sorry, just before we have the next question, just really quickly about where we're at with hatcheries. I know there was some talk about um, shutting hatcheries down and that sort of stuff. I mean, there is definitely a need for hatcheries, I'll, I'll say that, and not talking about putting trout on top of wild trout. Where we're at at the moment is we're about to spend, hopefully, a bit of money up, upgrading Snobs Creek, and the plan going forward is that Snobs Creek will be revitalised as a major trout um, production hatchery, but also that we'll be able to invest a lot in the breeding, large body and small body natives like Macquarie perch, trout cod, maybe blackfish as well, because we're on the verge of buying a significant piece of land near Shepparton to build our first new, um, our first dedicated native fish hatchery, and our first new hatchery in nearly 80 years. So it's a really exciting time. And when you think about, and Lotsi was really big on pushing that, I can see you there Lotsi nodding your head loving it, but when you think about that, we'll have two major hatcheries then in Victoria. So areas that have been turned on their head because you know, we've got pipes running the wrong way and water at the wrong time and we've got you know, irrigation practices and other practices that have really detrimentally affected these areas. We're really going to be able to rebuild the biomass of dirty fish in those waters, which is great. And also do some really good, strong trout production, which is very exciting next couple of years for us. So I did want to cut across questions. I'm sorry, I'm just telling you, I've got the roaming microphone. Hey, good day. My name's Shane. Just a question for the men and ladies in red. Um, I used to fish up in the uh, <coughs> upper Golden about 50 years ago when I had hair. Met a guy up there who said to me... I'll feel your pain. Yeah. <laughs> um, met a guy up there who was a scientist and said, don't eat the fish full of heavy metal. I didn't worry about them because they catch and release. Anyhow, I was going on the website the other day because I'm about to head up there for a couple of weeks fishing and I came across a uh, big health site who said, large, I won't read it all out, it's too long. Large brown trout, more than 40 centimetres, caught in the following locations are likely to contain high levels of mercury. Lake Eildon, Big River, Narco River. Now, I've got some friends who go fishing out there, they eat a lot of fish. Sometimes they're the women in fishing, the wives are pregnant, the girlfriends are pregnant, they shouldn't be going near it. I haven't seen any OHS issues raised about that anywhere on any campsites or, I mean, it might be out there, I just haven't seen it, but it seems a pretty significant issue. Particularly for women. Yeah, look, it's a really good point that you raise, and it's not just the Upper Goulburn. There are, I have seen the information about Lake Gildan, but also closer to Melbourne, the Maribyrnong, the Yarra, those sorts of things. There are health warnings up on the Department of Health website. We do include some of that information in the guide, and it generally goes to, you know, if you are pregnant or elderly, we you know, don't recommend you eat these fish more than once a week. That's the consistent health advice that's provided. Generally, I, I fish the upper gold most of my life. Maybe it's why I lost my hair. But <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, oh, I, I never actually caught that many fish, so that could have been another contributing factor. Uh, but it is something we do take seriously. It's a really good question. Um, and, it, and it does get raised quite a bit by people about, because there used to be a lot of mining up there and those sorts of things. Um, but we do ask people to be aware of those health warnings. Generally, if you're reasonably fit and healthy, the, the prevailing advice from DHS has been you should be okay, and that's that's what we've got coming through. It really is just for pregnant people, and those that are elderly or may have another um, challenge. Is that right? 
Good question, though. Thank you. I'm just looking for where Tilly's at with the microphone. Tilly, there's a few people down the front too. Yeah. Hey, guys. My name's Eddie. Uh, my question or my points in relation to access, and I know you guys are working on it. Um, and there's obviously a lot of reference material to look at in relation to it and the music. We obviously the target of one million angels being the objective. Increased pressure on our fisheries, particularly those within a day's trip of Melbourne, is obviously expected to increase. Um, and looking at cranberry in front of you, the access to that cranberry in front of you is obviously an issue. Um, would you look at the model fishing game New Zealand have used in relation to beats? You park your vehicle in front of the sign, which gives you access to that beat. If you fight come to a section, obviously one one stop can have two or three signs, you park your car in front of that sign and that's the beat that you're on. It's got a little map, you go down, that's, that's the start point, that's the finish point. Um, certainly will increase angler experience in terms of um, having people cut you off, people dropping in on you, um, you know, finding, finding a car, you can't rely on someone putting an upward downstream sign on the dashboard of your car. Um, would you be looking at using New Zealand example as a way of managing that increased pressure? It's a good question, we're open to all ideas. Like we really are. I just say so. Think about the Lower Goulburn from from Alexandra through to Molesworth. I mean, really, everyone hits the breakaway. They hit uh, Thornton Bridge. You know, they, there are about four or five spots that they hit really hard. And one of the big challenges is the private land on both sides uh, from about Thornton down to Molesworth. And um, if you head upstream from Molesworth, it is excellent fishing, but it's it's inaccessible to a lot of people. They're trying to find the way through. The challenge that we've got, and it's no disrespect to anyone, the challenge that we've got is there are people out there that are putting signs up, as Anthony said, on public land, saying it's private land and to keep out, right? So they may have grazing leases over that land, uh, but it is very clear in the legislation, access must be maintained to the public. And um, Now that, that um, with no, again, disrespect to any other agencies, isn't being enforced. And what we're finding is situation after situation where you could come across three different grazing license areas on a stretch of river, one bloke does the right, you know, lets you through, no problems at all, the gates are unlocked. You get to the next one, there's a padlock on it with trespassers prosecuted sign. When we look at it in the office, we can see it's public land. So one of the big challenges we've got, and you know, not, not discounting the idea that you, know, you can have beats and those sorts of things, is opening up all those areas that are currently illegally closed to fishermen. And it's not um, in any way disenfranchising environment groups by trashing national parks, you know, that people get sensitive about or um, you know, stepping onto people's private land, it is giving access to land that they should have access to. And just the other part, because I know I'm on a bit of a soapbox, is that often there are road reserves or um, crown land areas from main roads through to these parcels of land uh, that fences have been taken away from. So they look like they're just part of a farmer's paddock, but on a, they're actually a road reserve uh, that's been put in there. And if you actually just put a gate from the main road through, you could go through that road reserve and follow it down to the river and have really good access. So we're gonna get, look, look, this will be controversial because there'll be certainly some people who believe that that is, has been their entitlement for three or four generations, but it is something we're gonna get really serious about. You'll probably see a bit more in the media about it as we move more into this space. Um, but thanks for the question. Uh, there's lots of uh, really interesting subjects to cover here, and I've got a few questions, but I'll just stick to one it's really important one is for Hillary. Um, when's the best time to go fishing in Montana? What sort of thing do you <laughs> Well, for starters, you're welcome anytime. Please come. Uh, the fortunate thing for you all is if you decide to plan a trip to Montana, then it's like dry fly trout fishing all year, right? Because we're opposite, so you could have a never ending summer. So um, most people where I live in the Glacier National Park area like to come when it's relatively warm because that's a good time to have a vacation and they like to dry fly fish. And so that would be also when it's crystal clear, gin clear and the entire bottom of the river is like fruity pebbles. It's just fantastically beautiful and um, mountain goats are out and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, those would be in our summer months. So that's typically um, after runoff, which now, because of climate change, is very sporadic. Um, it's typically going to be now the end of June. Um, we start having runoffs April, May, and June, as opposed to the previous um, kind of June. So um, after the 4th of July through September is typically the time most people like to come and visit. 
And um, that's kind of the end of our summer and going into the fall. So you're hitting terrestrials and dry flats. If you like to avoid the crowds, then I suggest you come September or April, May, and kind of risk the weather. And um, that that's to target native West Slope cutthroat trout. So the reason most people come to my zone is for the opportunity to catch a native cutthroat in an intact ecosystem. Hello, my name's Greg. I just want to ask Gus, uh, to, I've got two questions for you. Um, if there's three of us in a boat, and um, one of us catch our bag limit, do we have to um, stop fishing and the other two can keep fishing? I heard that on David's show as well, but I've always wondered that. Yeah, it's a good question to get asked a lot. Um, simple answer is your catch is your catch only. So oh. once you're attaining the bag limit, you can't catch shit in the boat with your friends. Okay. That's a simple answer. Yep. And the other one is, um, on trout opening, I went up to Hilton and I was fishing there. and. I didn't see any inspectors there, and there was two guys there that caught 15 of the big stock. They had them on the bank, and other people had a go at them, but they were aggressive and they had knives. And then some of the angler fisheries, and um, so, as soon as they heard that, they got those fish and they took off. Why isn't there someone there just wandering up and down? I know there's a limited, but why have so many spots to put the fish in if you can't cover that ground? Um, I'll give you a bit of background for the trout. I mean, we had um, Operation Twitch on uh, for two weekends. They put the trout opening in phase two as the weekend following. Um, the first weekend we had 10 officers on the ground, including a cohort team. Um, the second weekend we had four officers on the ground. Um, we covered a lot, of, a lot of ground, obviously, during that weekend and speak to thousands of people. Um, we did have a couple of phone calls in relation to offending uh, a couple of the release points, uh, which we monitored um, actively over that couple of days. Uh, and there's a very high rate of compliance. Um, we do have offenders within the fishery, uh, just like any given fishery across the state, uh, where we watch those things very, very carefully um, with resources available. Yeah, you I do. Uh, my name's Lee, just a casual fisherman on YouTube as well. Well, actually, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, once more in regards to um, the carp virus that you were just mentioning, um, you said it has got a evident effect on trout. Has there been any tests or any light you can shed on whether that has any effect on native species? Yeah, so this is where it got controversial because uh, certainly some people were arguing the tests hadn't been conducted on trout. My information from the CSRO was there was. Um, research done on trout and that it had no impact on it. But when I was briefed on this initially, I mean, the evidence that I was shown by the CSRO said that if, if a carp and uh, another carp, um, but that second carp had 1% goldfish in it or roach in it or tension or something, or some genetic throwback from wherever, if they were in the same water together and the carp had the koi herpes virus, the other carp would not be impacted by it. It was that specific to the to the European carp profile, right? So the CSRO have argued strenuously that the work's being done on trout and on natives. However, I've seen the YouTube videos, I've seen fishermen put up there going, look, you know, we're worried about this, we're not sure it's gonna work, we think that it could go south. And, you know, and I don't wanna have a debate here today with people about whose science is better and all the rest of it. All I would say is, I'm yet to see anywhere around the world where that koi herpes virus has jumped onto another species. Any bit of evidence where people can say it's affected a native fish or a trout in those other areas. But for me, it's like one of these things, there is risk associated with everything, right? There is. Um, when the Khaleesi virus was accidentally released for rabbits off an island off South Australia, because um, they, you know, they may never release that either. I mean, Khaleesi virus has had a significant impact on rabbits. You know, Euroa, the Balmain Hill behind Euroa used to be crawling with them. I can't find a rabbit around Euroa these days. But yeah, lots of foxes. But uh, look, you know, there is risk associated with everything, but it's also opportunity. And, and, and you just have to go up these waterways, you know, Halkwa, Delatai, Jamison, any of them, and see the carp going up those waterways and see them tearing up the bottom. And it is a real tragedy. So I just say that. Yeah, but, um, probably something for the VFA, and I wouldn't mind hearing from ATF as well on this one. Um, 
when you Google the top 10 trout, uh, wild trout fisheries in Tasmania, seven of them are lakes, and yet all we've heard about when we talk about wild trout in Victoria is rivers. And I just, I guess um, my, my questions are, what are the fears they know about wild trout in lakes in Victoria? Um, and they may not be open access right now, but there's, there's certainly some wild trout lakes in Victoria. And uh, the second part of the question is that, um, you know, probably millions of dollars have been spent over quite a bit of time on, um, on uh, vegetation or rehabilitation of rivers and things like that. Has it ever come into anyone's, uh, or across anyone's thoughts to perhaps, you know, um, do something with creeks and rivers to, to establish wild populations in lakes? You know, put gravel beds in and things like that. I'm, I'm not a scientist, I don't fully understand it all, but, but create some sort of habitat where lakes could have self populating um, trout species. And, and, it's, and I guess it's, you know, the Victorian um, Wild Trout Strategic Plan, I, that certainly doesn't mention a lake at all. And uh, I think it's just something that may be missing. It's a couple of good questions, Dave. Um, so, wild trout lake fisheries in Victoria, we know that Eildon, um, William Hobble and Buffalo, and there's probably others as well, all have wild trout in them. We don't know to what extent how many of those fish are wild trout versus stock trout, because we do stock them as well. And as part of that um, wild trout strategy that we're proposing that's in draft, we've committed to looking at that for two lakes we tried to do it on Eildon the last couple of years, but it's so big and there's so many feeder streams where wild trout can come in. It was really difficult for us to mark all the stock fish and then monitor if they went up the rivers and what was the contribution of wild versus stock fish in the lake and the rivers. So we're going to do it on William Hovel and Buffalo, which are smaller systems, stock them with uh, lots of marked fish and carefully monitor those fish going up into the rivers and in the lake to try and get a handle on, yeah, is the lake population just our stockfish or are they wild fish coming down? And the same with those rivers. So to answer your question, we, we don't know. Um, most of our wild fisheries are, yeah, you're right, rivers, we call them. But the lakes do have the wild component. We're still trying to work out how much of it. I'm, I'm probably more talking about lakes that are, that are, that are not stocked though. Like, oh, like Tarago. Oh, Dartmouth, of course. Yeah, yeah. Tarago, yeah. Um, we were talking about a, a lake called yeah, Lake Tarley. <laughs> lake Tarley Tarn last night that's got trout. It certainly wouldn't be stocked. Um, but some of those lakes that aren't yeah. stocked. I mean, it's probably half the lakes that Martin and his kids are going. That's to exactly well, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've said so there's a lot of actual water impoundments that are close to fishing that we've never stocked that people sneak on the fences to and fish. And they reckon they're some of the best brown trout fisheries anywhere. No fishing pressure, they've never been stocked, they've come out of somewhere, and uh, you know, they're all around the place. Sure, um, and Dartmouth is one up there. Dartmouth is one of our best trout fishers, and we don't stop it at all. <laughs> Why lake fishing is so popular in Tasmania, and it's simply because our lakes are low and clear, and you can see the trout all year round. You know, in Victoria it's different, a lot of lakes are uh, either deeper and they're stratified, and you get fish going off the surface in summer. But you go to Tasmania and you can stalk individual fish on open lake shores all, all year round. So it's quite a different situation. And you know, when you've got open lake shores and big fish in the lakes, big wild fish, they're easy to hunt and stalk and offer all these different opportunities to see the fish, you know, doing the basking shark thing or the tailing thing or the leaping out of the water thing. And you compare that to our streams. Our streams are very good, but they don't offer such diverse fishing or such big fish. I think the situation in Victoria is a bit different. I think it's a stretch to think that most of your lakes would ever be as popular as the ones in Delhi. And the second part of your question was about spawning habitat, I think. Yeah. I only know a little bit about this, and John might, might be able to answer a bit more. We don't seem to see huge limitations with spawning habitat. There's been quite a few studies. There was concern about the golden tail race um, a few years ago, and some really good pieces of work which found that there's still ample spawning habitat, and it doesn't seem to be a limitation in our wild trout fisheries. I know of a couple of places where gravel has been put in, 
and anecdotally the fish seem to be spawning but we don't seem to see it make a meaningful difference to the fishery you know nature sort of covers that enough as it is from my understanding do you want to add to that john I'd agree with that. I'd agree with Taylor. Um, back on some uh, stock, uh, native, uh, sorry, um, wild trout lakes, like Dartmouth, Rocky Valley, Pretty Valley, there's a few. Uh, the thing about those lakes and that is that uh, they are on the map, they're their natural bit, that's what they are. It's really handy sometimes just to be able to manage fish by putting them in. So <laughs> the stock stuff is actually quite better to manage. So the bull marrows and current beets are good because we can manipulate those ones because we can stock them. If you've got the wild stuff on as well, there's always issues there whether you're wasting fish by putting them in the lakes. Um, limiting the number of fish maybe, you might have too many, so there's more like a rocky valley situation where you can go up there and there's lots of fish in there. It's good fishing, but you know, they're not sort of quality fish necessarily. People can know argue against it, but that's what I think my take on that. So, you know, if you could limit the number of fish in something like a rocky valley, like cut them off and spawning and stuff, it might be a good thing too. There's lots of ways to go about it. But, um, you know, do you really want to have spawning fish in some of these lakes? Maybe you do, but there is certainly something happening that um, you've got more control if you can just stop and then just know the reason. Joe Dawson here. Yeah, Hillary, I've got a question for you. I'm just wondering if you can tell us how, in, in your experiences, the waterways work with cohabitation, not of fish varieties, but rather of types of fishing. So if you have waters that are solely fly, solely bay, you know, cabot would somewhat lead to that decision. And I ask that not because I think that it's necessarily viable. I don't know anything about it. But I constantly hear people arguing about it and, and I'm trying to understand why yeah, don't that's like the, the Drake magazine or Fly Fishing magazine says you know it's like five dollars um, or seven fifty for bait fishermen um, to buy the magazine um, yeah it, I mean that to be honest that cultural rift is is there and is fun is good humored and in general fun in terms of the health of the fisheries a lot of it has to do not with the way that you're fishing out there, but what is actually happening with the fish. So because we have so many fisheries that are native fish, um, it's encouraged to fly fish there because um, even though it's legal to fish with conventional gear, even a treble hook, if you've got to stick a native West Slope cutthroat or bull trout on your hip to get that lure out of there, then you're responsible for that fish. And if that fish dies, that's on your hands and you're responsible for the death of that fish that is on the endangered species list. So people by choice, even though it is legal to fish with treble hooks and conventional gear on a swivel, um, know that that swivel is going to spin in a gill and you'll end up with bloody gills, you're gonna end up with a dead protected fish and that's on you. So that's happened unfortunately so many times that people know um, when you're fishing in a place where there is a native trout population um, with endangered and protected fish, that you're going to fish with a single barbless hook. So even if you're fishing conventional, if you're throwing spinning gear, um, we have fishermen who will take their tool and clip off the two hooks of the treble and pinch down the barbs. Um, where I fish, it's not required by law to have a single barbless or even to pinch down the barbs, but it might, if, you, you know, if you went there, you would think it was because everybody does. Everybody pinches down the barb because it's so easy then just to slip that hook out and this protected fish swims away. Um, so to answer your question, um, conventional and fly are allowed in darn near every zone. Um, there are some that's no um, live bait, but that has to do less about catching the fish and more about potentially introducing something that can change the PA of the river, um, like kind of meat, like sticking garbage in the in the river. So um, conventional and fly cohabitate on our river systems. But if you want to release a fish well, you're typically not throwing um, three hooks with barbs on them. Um, if you're using uh, mechanical equipment, if you're using conventional gear to throw it out there, you still pinch down the barb, you're not using a swivel, you're using a casting bobber, um, and it's one hook so that you're not caught with a dead trout. 
So, so in that case, the moral is what we need to do is really think about education and fish care. Yeah. And sustain what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you've got more than an eight-second ride from the time you catch it and you're fighting it and it's out of the water and you're holding it straight up and down and taking pictures, people are learning that those internal organs are dropping and um, you're hurting fish. They're understanding what happens when you're handling the fish. And if you're throwing a treble at a protected trout, um, it's real hard to get that out safely. And now you've covered in fish slime, you've removed the protective layer, they've lost their whole ra um, radar system. So yeah, that's, these are things that, um, that are known in western part of the United States. Uh, Ray, it was Ray. Right, 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 here we go. I think that's, we've run out of time for questions, but thank you for all of them. Ray, I'm going to hand to you, mate.